vast regions of the world's oceans and hundreds of estuaries and areas along our coasts have oxygen concentrations that are too low for many fish and shellfish to live and grow. Some of these low oxygen or hypoxic areas are natural, but many are caused by human activities that release nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, and fertilize the waters. Chesapeake Bay, the largest estuary in the U.S., is one of the estuaries that is suffering from too little oxygen in the water. Too many nutrients from farming, sewage, and industry are making their way into the Chesapeake Bay. We've turned our estuaries and our coastal waters into essentially poorly managed agricultural systems. We're dumping nutrients on them, just like you might put nutrients and fertilizer on a farm. In shallow waters, under natural conditions, enough oxygen is mixed in from the air to support life, because fish, just like you and I, need oxygen to breathe and to live. But when we are dumping too much nutrients into these systems, we get big algal blooms. The algae die, decay, they sink down to the bottom waters. And as they decay, that process uses up the oxygen and essentially takes that habitat out of the system in terms of its being able to be used by things like fish. Deep waters in the main stem Chesapeake stay low in oxygen for several months from late spring to early fall. But newer evidence shows that even very shallow water near shore can have a problem with low oxygen. Denise Breitberg and her team are trying to figure out what effects increased low oxygen levels might have on the animals of the Chesapeake Bay. We see a lot of low oxygen areas in the Chesapeake in these shallow areas. Things change from a day-to-day -day basis and from location to location. In the Chesapeake, oxygen levels go through daily cycles. During the day, when plants are photosynthesizing, they release oxygen into the water. But at night, they stop photosynthesizing, and both plants and animals continue to respire, causing a massive drop in oxygen levels. Breitberg and her team are sampling water and testing animals to find out if these daily drops in oxygen affect animals that are important to the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem and economy. It's 625 in the morning at the moment. So early in the morning, we would expect there to be the lowest oxygen readings of all day because phytoplankton have not been producing oxygen all night because it's been dark. And right now it's reading, it's reading three milligrams per liter, so it's low. If we didn't have a lot of nutrient pollution in Chesapeake Bay and in the Road River, we would still get day-night fluctuations in oxygen concentrations, but the fluctuations would be very small. But it wouldn't dip down to levels that are really harmful to animals. With the amount of nutrients we have coming into Chesapeake Bay, we have oxygen concentrations at nighttime in some of the really severely impacted areas. We can have oxygen concentrations going down near zero. Some animals can escape the low oxygen zones by swimming away. But not all animals are so lucky. Shellfish, like oysters, aren't able to move out as oxygen levels drop. Oysters are really important to the ecology of Chesapeake Bay. They play a major role filtering the water, removing algae, removing particles from the water. They also historically were a really important fishery in Chesapeake Bay. But populations now are only at about 0.3% of historical levels. But we're trying to restore them to a very different Chesapeake Bay than they lived in historically because of human impacts on water quality, including the resulting low oxygen. If oysters are to be restored, it is necessary to understand how low oxygen levels can leave them vulnerable to a single-celled parasite that can infect and eventually kill them. And what we're investigating is how these oysters, which can't escape the low oxygen because they're sedentary, how 
this low oxygen and low pH cycle on a scale of hours can affect disease transmission. And the disease that we're looking at is dermo. It's caused by a parasite called Perkensis marinus. See if I see if I get the same number again. The tanks on the top shelves contain infected oysters, and the tanks below contain younger, uninfected oysters. The oxygen levels are varied to follow a daily cycle. Okay, and then yeah. we'll get some, some fresh moved into here. Okay. Uh, we're providing water to all of the tanks from the river, but a small proportion of the water from the diseased tanks is pumped to the initially uninfected oysters to serve as the source of infection. And then we're varying the levels of oxygen in the water. And from that, we can see how the hypoxia affects disease transmission in the oysters. After about two months, some of the oysters are dissected to see if they've acquired the parasite. We are trying to assess the level of disease in these oysters, so we have to dissect them, take a portion of the tissue, incubate it, and then in five to seven days we'll be able to look under a microscope at the tissue and see what level of disease each of these oysters will have. With a microscope, Breitberg's team can observe the effects of the dermo disease on the oysters. Here's an example of what it would look like if you looked at it under the microscope. If we zoom in a little bit, you can start to see these black, very round cells in here. These black round cells are the Perkensis cells, so this is what we're looking at to determine the level of disease in this oyster. So this is actually a very light infection. This is a non-lethal infection in this oyster. Over time, the parasite reproduces and kills the oyster. So right here is, is an example of a lethal infection. What you saw before with the orange tissue, all of that tissue has now been taken up with these disease cells. So this, this oyster is just packed with the Perkensis spores. Even these short nightly drops in oxygen can have a devastating effect. Our research is showing that even brief exposure to low oxygen, just a few hours a day, is enough to really reduce the ability of oysters to fight off this disease. If oxygen levels continue to decrease, the largest estuary in the U.S. could see even larger effects on the animals that live there. But Breitberg and her team are hopeful because of planned changes that should reduce nutrients flowing into the bay. The combination of what we can do on land in terms of reducing nutrients to the bay and what we can do in the water by increasing oyster populations, the combination of those two may really be a major benefit to the ecology of Chesapeake Bay by improving water quality and getting it back to the point where now it's really good conditions for the animals that live here.